First up, a special tale about a relationship between a father and his son speaking frankly to each other for the first time. Reporter Hikurangi Kimiora Jackson asks why people join gangs in the first place. There's two individuals that end up in the gangs. One is one that's attracted to it, whether there's the element of ego or the other is that it's just a life that they've been lured into, opposed to the other individual that I believe is one that's born into the gang life by way of mum and dad entrenched in the gang life. David Latelli, family man, Christian and community stalwart. So it's about having a vision this is a programme he helps run for the Grace Foundation working with those who have come into contact with the law, some with gang affiliations. There are many of us I know throughout the community that are doing great work out there and actually sharing their experience for the betterment of someone that's coming through and they can see they're on that same path, they're on that same highway. All we try to do is say there's an off-ramp that you can take. You don't need to keep going on that highway to nowhere. David can relate to those in his program because he once lived a life of violence and crime. How would you describe the younger version of yourself? Well, the younger version of myself was just reckless, non-thinking of consequences, thinking that oneself was bulletproof, being antisocial, being rebellious, the world's against me. How do people react um, when they find out that, that you were once in a gang? one of disbelief <laughs> um, because I think they've seen uh, the transformed version of um, myself um, opposed to what it was uh, when I was um, entrenched in the gang life which are two completely different pictures. David was a feared young mob leader in Auckland. He says that despite having good parents he ended up a ward of the state and that led him into a new lifestyle that became dangerously attractive. I was so attracted to that, for some reason I just just lured in into, uh, to that life. And at the age of 15, 16, uh, I became a patch member for the, for the mob in Mangere, well, in Auckland. By the age of 17, I was the Sergeant of Arms, and then by 19, I was the Auckland President. David would be party to an armed robbery. It was serious, and so was the sentence handed down by the judge. In the cold cells of Paremoremo, a new reality sunk in for the Mungo mob president. I was serving a 10-year prison term for armed robbery back in the 80s. I lost all my 20s. I was only in my early 20s, so I wasn't home until I was 31. You know, a lot of time, a lot of time to think. Now, of course, as you know, the jails, and you can't escape the gang affiliation, uh, the gang way of um, communicating. You get ample time to uh, reflect on one's life. The first night spent in jail and to be put in a place that's well known or infamous for crazy reasons, it was a goal to reach there. We, we often refer to Paremoremo as the top. Uh, you're heading to the top. So that's where I ended up. Um, and I often share that first night in terms of um, being scared and, um, and vulnerable. And I mentioned the position that, you know, that I'd go into is that fetal position where you, <laughs> you shed a tear and you're in that fetal position of what the hell happened here, you know? The only way to change his life was to leave the gang world behind. So how did he do it? One, first and foremost, I just needed to do what I needed to do. Yeah. One of the known leaders uh, at the time when I came home uh, from the uh, prison term, and I just put all the books together and just went to his place and just said, I'm out, and then just walked. But I'm, I'm a strong belief that um, there are many that were there that are still there. Underneath the, the tattoos, underneath the markings, there's a little inner being <laughs> that, that wants out. I've often thought about those, just through the conversation that if things were different, they probably would prefer to have just walked away themselves. But I think because of being so deeply entrenched in it, it's almost like that feeling like I'm this far in, I can't get out. 
After one more stint in jail, David eventually went straight and now offers his time and experience to helping others. Three, two, one, seven, he co-founded the Grace Foundation, helping those struggling on the margins of our community. And it's something his son, David Latelli, also known as Brown Butterbean, does through the Brown Butterbean motivation. David Jr. has overcome a lot to get to where he is now. Mr. Latelli, were you ever nervous that your son might head down the path that yeah, you wanted? I think, it, I think that's the fear of many dads that are involved in gangs. As, um, I mean, they always say, you, you often hear it, don't you, where they don't want their kids to follow in their footsteps, you know. But, um, but there's an answer, you know, well then, walk away from it. I think for, in terms of the, the kids, a lot of the times this gang life's glamorised because it was, man, you know, as a youngster, I'd see the cars that we had, that my dad and uncle would have, and I'd see all the, the cash, and I wanted it, you know. When times got, I, I used it to motivate me to do things right, get it, get it the right way, but when things fell over, I still wanted it, and I did it the wrong way, just like what I saw. So our kids do what they see, you know, so it's, it's, it's definitely not glamorous. This is in fact the first time the father and son have discussed in depth David Senior's gang past. You two haven't really talked about a lot of the things that have happened early in your life. Why is that? Oh yeah, no, this is something we've never really spoken about. We've never sat down and talked about all the stuff that's happened in the past. I'd often ask Dad's old friends that we'd know. You know, I'd often ask them, oh man, what was he like back then? What was it like? What the stuff did you get up to, you know? Just to kind of get an insight into what it was like, but it's not, nothing that we've ever talked about, eh? I don't, I don't know why. Touchy, what do you think, Dad? Yeah, there's, for me, it's, there's always been that, um, that guilt in terms of um, the way, especially Dave and the sister, Vicky, um, we're raised. Sometimes I feel like I'm walking on eggshells when I'm around Dave. You know, it's not really a, a relationship that sh should be like father and son. I recall a time where I got out of that 10 year prison term and um, Dave was really wanting to come home. He was still in Australia at the time with my parents. And I just felt that maybe um, I didn't answer that call to get Dave home. There were things I needed to straighten out before I took on uh, the responsibility of uh, having Dave with me. But I think a lot of it stems from those days where I should have been a better dad. I remember that time when he, he's talking about, it's funny, it's, it's, um, I wasn't looking forward to actually doing this, you know. I, I was saying, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. And then when the, the, today came, I was like, oh man, I don't really want to talk about it, to be honest. I guess it's just the way, maybe that's why we've never talked about it. But I remember, <clears throat> just him saying that, I remember that time, because a lot of the stuff I've blocked out and I just, you know, you just block it out and don't think about it. But I remember that time where I was at, um, <clears throat> just remember when I was um, <clears throat> at my grandparents, you know, and just, just crying. <clears throat> I just remember when I was crying to um, come home and just that not happening, you know. That's all, that's, that's what I remember. But, uh, maybe that's why we don't talk about it. I don't want to talk about it, to be honest, but because it's just all that, that uh, emotion's still there. It's just hiding, you know? But it's the only way you get over it by talking about it. Mm. You know, one of, one of the things I have um, over the years, um, found it easier now to say to my son is that I love him and you know that was a that was quite a difficult um, three words to say yeah I just want you to know Davey that I love you yeah I've always loved you and it's been something that I you know that I've found easier over the years to say to you so yeah <laughs> yeah that's a 
yeah, it's not something. But I appreciate, yeah, it's all good there, man. I love you too. And it's, um, you know, one thing I got from my dad and my mum is work ethic. You know, now I'm applying that work ethic to, uh, to serve others and to be the best version of myself. So, you know, I got a lot from them. And look, I went through a lot, but that's just part of the journey. You know, so always, you know, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> I'm proud of what he's doing now and I'm proud of the work he's doing and helping others. And I'm proud that he's my dad. That's a lovely story from reporter Hikurangi Jackson. We want to thank both men for sharing their story with us and their experience with others. Big fat shout out to Brown Butterbean Motivation and the Grace Foundation for their great mahi in our communities.